Be seated, please. I want to uh, invite you to turn to the book of James again. We're going to look at, uh, as we're winding down the last chapter in this little letter, uh, that James, the brother of Jesus and one of his disciples, uh, has written to a church, a church undoubtedly that was in the midst of difficulty and uh, a measure of suffering. Um, and he said many things to them. It revolves around this idea of, uh, yes, it's important to have faith, but it's important that that faith bears fruit in our lives. James has told us that without uh, works, our faith is dead. That over and over he's asked us to examine our hearts to say, this is what faith would look like. Is this the picture of faith in your life? If not, we need to ask ourselves, do I have genuine, real faith in my life, or is it just something that I say? And so the outworking of faith. Now we're going to get to this place today where we're going to talk about patience. Um, and as I said to the children, we've heard that over and over, that patience is a virtue. In fact, I saw a little cartoon this week that said, um, if patience is a virtue for me, why can't hurry up be a virtue for you? Um, I think Patience is something that we all acknowledge when we see it, but boy, it's so hard to come by. In fact, sometimes you can see people who generally uh, almost, you could just almost feel how much they want to be patient, but it just doesn't seem to be working for them. In fact, uh, one lady said that she was in the nursing home, uh, I'm sorry, in the grocery store, and she was uh, watching a young father who was pushing, he had the little baby seat on the front of the car, shopping cart, and he was going up and she was in that pattern where she passed him on every aisle. And every time she passed by, he was putting his hand on the little baby there and, she, and he was saying, keep calm, Albert, keep calm. And the next time she passed him, the baby was just screaming at the top of his lungs and he was patting him on the head, um, uh, trying to reassuringly say, keep calm, Albert, keep calm. And finally, before they got to the end, she said, you know what, he looks like he's having a hard time. I want to encourage him for being so kind and so patient um, to the baby. So the next time they met, she said, I am so impressed, she said, uh, to show your patience to little baby Albert there. And she said, lady, his name is John, I'm Albert. Can't you see that sometimes on people's faces and their demeanor is, I know I'm supposed to be patient here, but it's just not working for me. Now, I do want to tell you this before we even read these verses, that the patience James is talking about here, I'm not sure really is exactly for crying babies or waiting in long lines or some of the things like I talked to the children about. I think this is a different kind of patience. Um, in fact, the Greek words that we'll read here for patience has to do with long suffering. Um, and even the technical word here is um, long obedience or um, long tempered. Now we don't, we use the opposite of long tempered, right? If I said, um, boy, she is really short tempered, you know what I mean by that. But I don't know that I've ever heard anybody say, boy, he's a real long tempered guy. But the word long-tempered would be almost a direct translation of the word um, patience here. But not in just little mundane things, um, but in bigger lifelong things. How is it that we can remain patient over the course of our life when often as these people that James is writing to are going through hard times? These people were being persecuted. In fact, we've already seen in this letter that James refers to that the rich were oppressing the poor. Uh, that people were mistreating each other. They were talking um, about each other in ways that they shouldn't. And James has been reminding them that um, those kinds of things in our lives ought to reflect a faith. And so what he's saying in these verses that we'll read today is that we should um, be obedient to some commands that come from the scriptures and we should do so because it reflects a genuine faith. And they're all kind of hang on this idea of patience. And so as we read these uh, verses, 
Uh, you're going to see really uh, in verses 7 through 12, and I'm going to leave 12 off for today and we'll treat those um, at a later time. But in those verses 7 through 12, we read all of them, there are six commands that are there. And twice it says, be patient. And you'll notice in a minute it'll say, stand firm, don't grumble. And then the last two that we're not going to read today says, don't swear and let your yes be yes and your no be no. And we'll come back to those. So let's read. Uh, starting with verse 7, we'll read down through verse 11. Hear the word of the Lord from the book of James. Uh, this is chapter 5, beginning with verse 7. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too, be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. May God bless his word to us today. Um, I want to get to these three commands. It's really four commands because be patient is twice. Instead of just doing them one at a time, let me just leave all three of them up there. Be patient, stand firm, and don't grumble. That'd be pretty good advice in almost uh, any situation in life, particularly a difficult situation in life. It sounds like that advice that gets handed out a lot with nothing to really back it up. If you were to say to somebody who's having a really difficult time in life, well, just be patient, stand firm, but don't grumble about it, um, you probably wouldn't get a very good reaction, would you? Thanks a lot. Um, I, I could have figured that on my own. Or easy for you to say, that's probably the most common uh, thing we would get. But yet, Paul uh, James gives that uh, advice here, that command really to do these three things. In fact, the patient part, he says twice. So how could James say such a thing and it not come across as just some platitude of, uh, I'm going to send you on your way with some kind of positive thinking? Well, let's think about first being patient. What does he really mean here? Well, notice what he says that ought to inform our patience because patience without something to inform uh, of, uh, us of, of something that's true, that something that matters, really is just an empty thing to say, right? Just have patience. Well, my first question is, why? Why should I have patience? This is a difficult circumstance. You don't understand what it's like, and it's easy for you to say that, so why should I? And I think James gives us the why. Listen to what verse 7 and 8 say again. Be patient then, brothers and sisters. And by the way, did you notice how many times just in those short, short verses he reminds them he's talking to brothers and sisters in Christ. This is for those who belong to Jesus that you should be patient, and I think what he wants us to know is that we can be patient. So be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and the spring rains. You too, be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. I think what James wants us to know is we can be patient because there is a day that's coming. A day we like to say is fixed in eternity. That when Jesus promised that he was coming back, that day is coming. And because we know that that day is coming, there is a platform on which we can stand, a foundation on which we can stand firm on to know that we can wait for that day because he assuredly will come. Well, what's so great about that day um, what a big question that is. It's a day when Jesus will come and everything will be set right. We go to the end of the Bible in Revelation. It says on that day we will ascend to heaven with him and we will find the new heavens and the new earth where there's no more sorrow, no more tears, no more death and dying. And on that day we will be with the Lord. That's what that day means. And everything else that we have lived through up till that moment will all melt away and it won't matter anymore. And it will all seem worth it. 
that we have persevered until the end. It's ironic, you know, when we ask people to stand up um, to take wedding vows, um, that we ask people to take some vows, and the ones that I use most in weddings always include, um, do you now take this woman or take this man to be your lawfully wedded wife or husband? And then one of the things that I always says, many of your wedding vows probably said this, was in plenty and want, in sick sickness and in health, until death do you part. Why would we add in sickness and in health, in plenty and in want, because all of us, our experience, sooner or later, we'll, we'll have plenty or we'll have want, we'll have sickness and we'll have health, but it all comes together. How is it that we can be patient of that? Well, we're asking you to sign up for that now. And how many of us, when we come to those times of want or of sickness, we start thinking, man, I didn't know I signed up for this. But how do we know that there's not this day coming. It's one thing to sign up for it, but this day that Jesus promises to us, that James points us to, makes all the difference in the world. In fact, it always has been that way. Some of the slave songs from back that originated in the 1800s that we still sing today, in fact, most of those, they used to be referred to as Negro spirituals. I'm not sure if that's politically correct anymore, but um, those songs of slavery have always been that, whether it was American slavery or other places. What is the theme of all those types of songs? It's that one day things will be set right. Why do we sing about such things is in the midst of terrible turmoil, per, terrible turmoil, persecution, um, suffering is that I'm looking forward to the day that Jesus comes. What do some of those songs say? I looked over Jordan and what did I see? What was it? Coming for to carry me home. And then the prayer, swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. Can you imagine a slave mistreated, suffering, working out in the hot sun and looking up at that sky and say, one of these days, that chariot's going to come. It's going to take me away from all of this suffering. It's that day that can get us through this day. That day makes all the difference in the world. And maybe that day didn't come today. Maybe it won't come tomorrow, but it's coming. As sure as anything is in all eternity is, that day will come when Jesus will come and he will make things right. In fact, James says uh, this word that he uses for the Lord's coming. There's three or four different words in the Bible uh, that refer to Jesus as coming back um, this one happens to be a word called parousia. You might have, if you've read some theological things, sometimes that's used uh, as a transliteration in English. We use that word sometimes. But it's a very specific way to speak of Jesus' coming. It doesn't just mean Jesus' arrival, but His presence that affects everything will now come. It's not that Jesus is going to show up and it's a pep rally because he's come. It's that he's going to come and everything's going to change. That his presence, his rule, and his reign will now change all eternity. So how are we to be patient in suffering? Is we anticipate that coming of Jesus, that presence of Jesus, that Jesus of setting things right. And Paul, uh, well, I keep saying Paul, I'm teaching Paul on Wednesdays and James on Sundays. James says to us, the Lord says to us, there's an illustration we can look around in everyday life. The farmer does this year in and year out. James must have had a real connection to agricultural things. He uses those types of illustrations often. And James says that look at the farmer. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and the spring rains. If you have an older version of the Bible, it may say the former and the latter rains. In, Jesus, in James's day, in that part of the world, you would plant in the autumn, in the fall, and there was more rains then. It was a good time to plant. But then you had to go through a much drier season. You had to await the spring rains, the latter rains, and it wasn't until those latter rains came that the crops would yield its fruit. And so the farmer knows that you have to wait through all that dry time, and when the rains begin to come, you still have to wait in anticipation for that day. Some of you who are farmers or raise things like that, you know it's a struggle to wait because it's out of our hands. 
And in one sense, um, being out of our hands makes us nervous, but isn't it much better to know if it's out of my hands, if it's in the hands of someone that's much more capable than I? I can't make the sun shine. I can't make the rains come. I can't make the soil produce what it does. Only God can do that. Well, the illustration is your life is exactly like that. There's a time when seeds are planted and there may be a season in our life where it looks dry, where God may seem desti- um, distant. And I've really never understood, I, I, I've, heard, I've heard singing groups called Ladder Rain, where we used to live in Flowood, there's a neighborhood called Ladder Rain. I really never was sure, I thought it was from the Bible, I'm never sure what that meant. Well, it comes from right here. Why are the Ladder Rains so great? Because we know the time is near. Jesus will indeed come on that day. And the fruit of all our living here will come to fruition in that day when Jesus comes. So we plant, God more specifically has planted in us. We patiently wait for the coming of Christ. And then the harvest will be brought in. And all the waiting, all the patience that's based on that day, uh, as uh, 1 Corinthians says, our faith will become sight on that day. Let that inform our patience. And then very quickly, he just says, stand firm. It makes more sense to know if all that is true, that there is a day fixed in eternity when Jesus will come again, then we can have patience, but then we could also stand firm. This word came up in our Bible study this week from the book of Galatians. It's actually a military term, which kind of makes sense if uh, the commanding officer is there with his troops and the, the attack is coming from the enemy and the commanding officer says, stand firm, men. It has to do with bravery and resoluteness. Um, in fact, one of the, my favorite definitions I saw is it's a firm courage. Isn't that what the knowledge that Jesus will come one day ought to allow in us? That I can have patience, but I could also have firm courage in this life. That whatever I face, I'm not facing it alone. That Jesus has promised to never leave me or forsake me. That God has promised his his presence in my life. That all the grand promises of the Psalms are yes and amen. He is my rock. He is my fortress. He is my refuge. All those things give us a resoluteness, a firm courage. In fact, in Galatians, we looked at this last week in our Bible study, it gives us a reason for that standing firm. Um, In Galatians chapter 5, in the first verse, it says, Stand firm then, because Christ has set us free. And what Paul is telling to the Galatians in his letter is, don't give up on your faith in Jesus Christ that he has paid for your sins and he has given salvation as a gift. These people were uh, threatening to go back to an old way of life to trying to work their way into heaven. And Paul says to them, don't give up. You've been set free by Jesus Christ, so stand firm on that truth that you've been set free. What does James say here is that Jesus has done the same thing in our hearts. He set us free to live obedient lives in him. That we can do this. We can have patience. We cannot grumble. We can stand firm. We can do all of these things because Jesus has done that. And he is coming. And more than that, he says, his coming is near. And that leads us to our last one is don't grumble. And this is maybe the uh, most immediate sense of what he gives the uh, rationale for. How is it that I cannot grumble? Did you catch what it said? Because, it says, be patient, stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. And then he says, don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. In other words... Jesus is coming, he's coming soon, and he's coming as the judge. And he's going to look at our life and say, show me the evidence of the faith that you claim to have. And one of the ways that I will see that your faith is genuine is, you're not going to grumble against one another. Notice again, he said, brothers and sisters. How many of you know when things go bad in the church, often we turn on each other immediately? James knew that. That when things get hard, we start blaming one another. We start saying things like, don't tell me that. Easy for you to say. Don't give me advice that you're not willing to follow yourselves. He says, don't grumble because the judge is at the door. What if we actually lived like that is the reality because it is? 
What if when we're all together, that Jesus literally was standing on the other side of that door? You know, we all do that. James has spoken uh, to us about the tongue and the evils that it can cause. What if every time we got ready to say something about someone, we could never be sure they weren't just on the other side of the door? Have you done this? Joel's sitting down for here front, so I'm going to pick on him. What if, what if somebody said to me, you know, uh, Joel, what do you think of him? And I said, Joel? Let me tell you about Joel. What am I doing? I'm looking to see because I don't want him to hear what I say about him. I've even seen people do that. They go to the door, they open it up, look up and down the hall. Let me tell you what I think. Well, if we're scared that they might hear it, then it probably shouldn't be said. How much more so than the grumbling that comes out of our mouth? He says, don't forget, Jesus is coming. He's coming soon. In fact, he's right at the door. So when I grumble, I'm really saying God doesn't know what he's doing. That Jesus isn't coming like he said he was. Or maybe I'm saying, I'm not going to be judged for these things that I'm doing. Now there is a sense in which the free forgiveness of sin is offered to all brothers and sisters in Christ that James is writing to. But there's also a reality is that the scriptures say that every idle word that comes out of our mouth will have to be accountable for that on the day of judgment. That every time we grumble against each other and particularly against God himself because we act like he doesn't know what he's doing, we're going to have to give an account before that on the judgment day. What a terrible thing that will be. Now, I do believe that if we are true brothers and sisters in Christ, if we have trusted in faith for the forgiveness of our sins, we'll be forgiven for those things, but we're going to have to give an account for them before God. So don't grumble because the judge is at the door. Jesus himself is. Act and speak like Jesus is just on the other side of that door. And then, in closing, let me say something about the coming of Jesus. Um, He points us to, in those last few verses that we read, starting with verse 16, uh, examples from the Old Testament. He says, brothers and sisters, I'm sorry, in verse 10, brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. James is saying, look at the the Old Testament saints, the prophets, people like Moses, David, Elijah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel, all faced all kinds of suffering because of their faith. And one of the things James wants to say is we can't expect suffering, but we should be patient in that suffering because Jesus is coming, but it's the unanimous experience of all brothers and sisters in Christ is we do suffer even for preaching and declaring the name of Jesus. So we can expect it, but he also says there's blessing in um, that suffering. And because there will be blessing, it should give us patience. There's a reward at the end. Go back and read Hebrews chapter 11. It lists this hall of fame of faith of all these people, including some of those that I mentioned, that had such great faith. And in the end, Hebrews 11 says, and they didn't even get to see the end of that faith yet in their lives, but we do. Because we have the word of God that tells us we know how all of this ends. It comes with Jesus coming and making everything right. So we can expect suffering. There is blessing in suffering. There is purpose in suffering. The whole book of Job um, is a long book that demonstrates that yes, there is great suffering. And yes, often it seems so random, so um, out of control. And yet in the end, we find that Job found a purpose in his suffering. He was tested in his faith. He demonstrated, God did to Satan, that there was a man who had true faith because his faith continued through his suffering. It helped Job to know God better. And he was blessed more than he ever was before as he got through his suffering. But you know what the greatest thing that suffering teaches us is what the end of verse 11 says. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. That's one of the things that informs our faith, that Jesus is coming. How do we know that Jesus is coming? Well, he says he is coming. And how do we know that God um, still is going to do what we need because all we need is that compassion and mercy to see us through in those things. 
You know, some of you may have seen a few months ago, I was part of a, a group of folks that was doing uh, just a little bit of grief counseling at one of the schools here where a student had passed away. Um, and they asked me, the, the TV people were there and the, the headmaster over there said, would you be willing to say something in front of the cameras? Or she said, do you want to say something in front of the cameras? And I said, no. And she said, would you be willing to say something in front of the cameras? And I said, yes reluctantly and I went in the room on the side there and he turned the camera on the guy stuck the microphone there and he says what do you say um, to students who are going through something like this and the first thing that came to my mind is I think it's what we all want in times like that we want to know that God is still good and James reminds us that the Lord is full of compassion and mercy God is good our circumstances might not feel good. The outlook on life might not look good. But God is good. He's full of mercy and compassion. How can we possibly get through? How could I say to anybody, be patient, stand firm, and don't grumble? Because God is full of compassion and mercy. That's a truth that's as sure as the coming of Christ, that God is indeed good. And even when we can't see the goodness, he promises us. That's why I shared the verse with these children. It's a lot easier before we get in the midst of that to know that truth, to believe that truth, that God works for the good of those who love him and call according to his purpose. That's a bitter truth sometime in the midst of our suffering. It's a hard truth to cling to, but it's still a truth. And it should allow us some form of patience, some form of standing firm, and some ability not to grumble. Now I want you to consider this. James, who's the brother of Jesus, is writing this letter. James was there some 20, maybe as many as 30 years before he wrote this letter. He was there on the day that the resurrected Jesus... The one who had suffered, who had died on the cross, who was in the grave three days, but then returned from the grave. And he spent some time with his disciples, including his brother James, and many other people. And in Acts chapter 1, we read this, that Jesus went up into the clouds and ascended into heaven. And this is the record of it in Acts chapter 1, verse 9. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside him. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? Dumbest question an angel's ever asked. Why are we looking into the sky? Because Jesus just went up into the sky. But notice what he says. This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. How long do you think they sat there and stared into that sky? He didn't say how long, and they probably had every reason. He was only in the grave three days, so maybe the next day they looked, and the next day, but probably starting on the third day, they probably walked around like this a lot, thinking, he's coming any time. And then what happened after a week went by, and a month went by, and a year went by, and then 10 years went by, and maybe as many as 20 or 30 years, do you think they looked less or they looked more? Well, I think James is saying, I'm still looking. Jesus is coming. And I want to give you this picture. This is the closing image I want you to see. Is we've looked into the sky, particularly a night sky, and we've seen those flashes of lightning. It's so powerful, it's so ominous sometimes. Matthew chapter 24, Jesus says this, For as lightning that comes from the east is visible even in the west, so it will be at the coming of of the Son of Man. I read about a guy who was on a plane in one of those night skies and flying above the sky, above the clouds. The lightning can be even more um, powerful display before him. And he said, I began to think that every time that lightning flashed, I thought about Matthew 24, 27. That Jesus says, as the lightning flashes across the sky, so will be the coming of man. That that day when Jesus comes, it may happen like that. That there will be that lightning bolt descend to the earth. And instead of going back into the heavens, the sky will begin to be torn apart. And the coming of Jesus will begin at that moment. 
Paul later tells us in Thessalonians, says, the Lord himself will come down out of heaven. Picture out of that flash of lightning, now Jesus breaking through. With a loud command, with a voice of the archangel and the trumpet of call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and we will be with the Lord forever. Paul adds one last line there, encourage one another with these words. I want to encourage you, look to the sky today. When you go out of here, clouds, clear skies, and particularly when you see those flashes of lightning, pause for just a moment and say, is this the day? Is this the moment? Let me see if that uh, lightning recedes back into the blackness or is an even brighter light going to come forth from it. He's coming. A day is fixed in eternity when Jesus is coming. Paul says encourage one another with these words. James says uh, be patient, stand firm, don't grumble. That day is coming and Jesus will set all things right. Until that day, let your faith be an action in your life. Fix your eyes on Jesus, particularly on his compassion and his mercy. Be patient because a better day is coming. In this life, but for sure in the next and his purpose is to get us to that day be patient stand firm don't grumble let me pray our heavenly father we are thankful for your son jesus we thank you that he is coming again i pray that we would have eyes of faith to see the coming of jesus christ and that as we do that you would allow us to live by faith in this life that more and more every day we would uh, picture the coming of Christ. And even in those flashes of lightning that happen so often in our lives, we would pause momentarily that anticipation of the coming of Christ, we would let that come to bear upon our hearts, that it would be a foundation on which we can stand in praise and glory and honor to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I pray that we could be patient. I pray that we could stand firm. And I pray that we would not grumble against one another and particularly not against the Lord. And we could do all of that because you uh, are full of compassion and mercy and kindness, love and grace. So I pray that that would fill us this day and lead us up from here. So we thank you for that and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.